students, I want to welcome you to Nursing 124. I'll be your instructor for 8B for Nursing 124. My name is Dr. O'Shaughnessy. And um, obviously with what is going on in our community and in the world today, all your lecture will be on an online delivery type of system. So right now what I have up here on the screen is um, we're going to start with our um, information that was in your assigned reading from your dimensional analysis book and then we'll talk about the medications that were assigned uh, for week one. Now as you hopefully have found out as you've uh, read through um, the Canvas course of Nursing 124 that your lab will be delayed till uh, summer. Um, it's very difficult to do a, uh, a checkoff when you're not present and at this point in time we're not able to have students present at the college for their checkoffs so your lab will be delayed but you will see some information uh, given to you that will help you better be prepared for your skills checkoff uh, those will be in uh, week three uh, which will entail a um, demonstration of an injection either IM sub-Q or intradermal and then your second checkoff will be in week seven which will involve um, demonstration of starting an IV with um, choosing the proper solution and um, all the other equipment necessary to hang an IV. So um, I will be providing information along the way which will help you prepare for those skills checkoffs and so um, please at any time uh, during the next seven weeks uh, we will hopefully stay very connected and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. In week two I would like to start and schedule a type of WebEx um, conference call where we can all uh, join in and discuss any of the uh, material or information uh, that you're required to read and uh, review and go over and uh, just a time to uh, stay connected as a class um, and I as well stay connected to you as the student so I feel that um, you are understanding the information. I would like some feedback uh, because this is extremely important that you understand this information and of course understand your medications as well. Um, with your DA book um, there is there are suggestions that I've given you in your uh, weekly lesson plan to do some of the um, practice problems or do some of the chapter post test to uh, kind of evaluate your learning from the chapters and the reading and the information that's been presented to you. So I strongly recommend that you do that because without having lab um, you do have some extra time to be able to um, really master some of this information and um, be very well prepared um, for the test which test one will be in week three. Um, but please I will be checking my email very frequently um, to see if anybody has any questions not necessarily about um, the information that was assigned to you but also just to be sure that you're all doing okay I'm here for you in any way we're going through a very difficult time right now but I want to stay positive and I think we can all get through this and as long as we um, are honest and communicate with each other, I think we're going to have a very, very good class. Um, I really enjoy a lot of this information. Uh, the medications are very interesting. And please understand that the medications we will be discussing will definitely correlate with the information that's being presented to you in Nursing 122 uh, so that... Uh, um, you can understand how some of the disease processes that your lecture instructor presents to you um, uh, is um, definitely um, um, kind of fits in with the medications that we're going to be talking about okay so um, let's stay positive and be excited about learning all this uh, new information that obviously makes us um, better prepared to provide excellent and safe care to our patients okay so um, 
As you can see, um, this Chapter 9 uh, has been provided to you in your Canvas course, and I'm just going to go over some of the highlights. The main information from this chapter is really about injectable medications and learning about the parts of the syringe and the different types of syringes and really making sure that you understand about calibrations and about the different sizes of needles as well. So, um, but this is here for you to review as often as you would like. And obviously with our online lectures, you can listen to me as often as you like as well. But please, um, I am here uh, to answer any questions. And like I said, probably on Sunday night, I'll send a, um, a note in the announcements about when we will schedule that WebEx um, chat time. Now that's not mandatory. Um, but I do want to keep that connection between uh, you as the class and uh, me as the faculty because uh, I'm definitely very um, sad that we're not going to be able to see each other in person, but still we can talk with each other um, in, a, in, a, in a live conversation so that I can alleviate any concerns or issues that you may have or to answer any questions that you may have. Okay? so. Um, Let's be positive and uh, move forward so that um, we have a better understanding of the information that's presented to you uh, in this chapter. So um, as with any chapter, um, you can see that um, there are objectives. Um, we're going to look at the medication label, uh, describe the information found on a package insert, and discuss the different types of solid and liquid forms of medication. And um, we're not going to calculate oral doses or dosages because you have done all, all that already from Nursing 123. And like I said, the main information from this is really uh, learning about the syringes, the parts of the syringe, and of course being familiar with the different calibrations depending on what size syringe you're working with. Okay. All right, first of all, um, it's very important to uh, look at the medication labels, and this makes perfect sense because this has a lot of important information about the drug that you're administering. And these are all the things uh, that that label that label will tell you about the drug. And as nurses, uh, when you're ready to administer a, a medication, obviously you want to think about, okay, why is the physician ordering this medication for my patient? What is the goal here? Okay. And again, uh, these labels will talk about what disease or disorder the drug is used to treat, and then some um, prescribing guidelines, and then of course to know some of the adverse drug reactions and interactions, and any type of warning or cautions about the use of that drug. Okay. And a nurse must be able to read and interpret this information in order to fill, fulfill the six rights of safe medication administration. Again, the components of this medication label is to uh, provide you drug names, the chemical name, the generic name, and I'm not going to go into detail. You can read these um, PowerPoint slides as well. Um, and of course, the trade name, and that's probably one thing that we're kind of more familiar with, especially I am. That's how I kind of learn my drugs um, through the trade name, and that's another name for a brand name. Um, but it's important that um, we know uh, the other names as well. Um, there's also the chemical name and of course the generic name, okay? And um, this is just an example of a medication label and as you can see it tells you the, the chemical name of the drug. The generic name is clarithromycin, and of course, you're probably more familiar with biaxin, which is the trade name of this drug. And like I said before, this is how I learned many of these medications. So I've had to kind of convert my thought process and think about, okay, what is that generic name of the drug? Because this is what you're going to be given on your NCLEX exam, um, all the generic names of your drugs, okay? Um, 
the National Drug Code number. Um, it talks about that as well. I'll let you read that at a later time. And a search of the FDA's National Drug Code directory reveals the following about Biaxin. So it talks about more about details about that medication. Okay. talks about this uh, drug comes in what form um, and obviously this uh, particular medication comes in tablet form. It also talks about routes of administration, and this is really important because there may be um, an important information about this drug which tells you, for instance, it can be given intramuscular, but you should not give this drug intravenously, all right? So it warns the user about ways the drug should not be administered if it is a high-risk drug. So very important to know, okay? So this talks about dosage strength. The dosage strength of the drug is the amount of active ingredients per dosage unit. And again, that dosage unit is in the form of the medication. Those most common are milliliters for liquids and tablets or capsules for solids. And the amount of the active ingredient will be listed in grams, milligrams, micrograms, units, or milli equivalents. So important to know. All right. And the dosage strength is the amount of active ingredients per dosage unit. And, oh, I just got done talking about that, sorry. And please note that uh, many times you'll find a medication may have two or more active ingredients or two or more medications in maybe one pill or tablet, and it will give you the strength of both of those medications. For instance, the drug Lortab 5 slash 500 contains the narcotic hydrocodone, uh, which has 5 milligrams of hydrocodone, and acetaminophen, which has 500 milligrams. And there's different um, strengths as well with this particular medication. You may find it a 7.5 slash 500, or it can um, provide up to 10 milligrams of hydrocodone and 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. So it is important to carefully read the drug label so the correct strength is selected. And you might find various um, dosage of this Lortab in your Pixis, so you want to make sure that you're pulling the correct medication and giving the correct dosage of that medication. So very important to know. So um, obviously when you're um, administering these meds and clinicals, um, you have your um, instructor who will definitely help you with the med checks as well. And then of course we have um, lot number and expiration date and it's really important too with your labels to be sure that um, the medication has not expired. Okay, and this is important right here when we talk about the expiration date. It is the date by which the manufacturer guarantees that the medication will be chemically stable and its potency and safety maintained, and that's really important. Um, the pharmacy techs are real good about um, checking those PICSs to make sure there isn't any outdated medications because there are some medications that we don't give frequently and they may sit in that Pixis for a while without ever being administered. So we want to make sure that when it is finally ordered that the medication is still um, uh, able to be um, administered, you know, and that it's uh, not going to, um, you know, lose its potency by being um, outdated. All right. So important to know about that. All right. Um, and then we have um, other label information, storage instructions, um, because that's all about maintaining the potency and uh, uh, efficacy of that medication, okay? Because we want to make sure that when we're uh, giving that medication that we're giving it at its full uh, potential.
all right, to our patients. And then, of course, any type of warnings that would contain information about potentially harmful side effects, use during pregnancy and lactation or other points deemed important by the manufacturing. Very important to know, okay? And it's also um, necessary, too, uh, that... Um, we know what other medications our patients are on because sometimes um, there may be some interactions with a medication that has just been recently prescribed with maybe something else that the patient is taking. Our pharmacists are really good about picking up on that, but still as a nurse it's very important because sometimes that is a concern for a patient when they're on a lot of medications already and then we have um, a new medication ordered, uh, the patient and even the nurse may be concerned, is this going to interact with the meds that the patient is already on? And that's a good point because sometimes it could potentiate the action of that med. All right, so things to think about. And that will make more sense when we start discussing some of the medications because there are some um, medications out there that when they're given with other medications, it can potentiate the action of that particular medication. Uh, there's also uh, information on that label that um, explains the directions for mixing or reconstituting, and some medications must be mixed with a dilutant before administration. And we'll go into that a little more detail because there is a chapter about reconstituting meds that I will go over with you. Um, usual dosage, some labels may provide usual dosage instructions. If not, this information can be found in the package insert. And the usual dosage may not be the same as the dosage prescribed by the provider, but you still want to be sure that you're administering a safe dose to the patient. And that's why it's also important that we're aware of our patient's uh, labs, especially when we're talking about liver and kidney function. Uh, we may decrease the dosage of a particular medication due to the fact that the patient may have some uh, in, uh, insufficient uh, renal, disease, renal function or uh, insufficient um, liver function as well. So these are things, you know, we're always having to think all the time. Um, and the goal is to provide the best outcome for our patient, but also to keep the patient safe as well, okay? So that's about reconstituting that I will go over later on with you. Um, there's also a package insert, and this is a document that is included in the medication surrounding box or wrapper, and the insert contains information about the medication in far more detail than the sticker label. So if the package insert is not available, most unit nursing units have drug reference material readily available in book or electronic form. And many of your electronic, electronic medical records do have um, a, um, an area where you can get on and learn more about the medication and even do a, um, a compatibility check, you know, with um, are these particular medications compatible, especially when you're uh, providing um, IV medications as well. So important to know as well. So the package insert um, contains the full prescribing information, including all of these. I won't get on that. You know, it's important, too, about drug and food interactions. So, um, you know, don't forget about that as well, um, especially food with what the patient may take. Um, something like a particular fluid that they drink um, may be um, contraindicated. Um, and, and that'll make more sense when we talk about some of the medications from week two. And um, I'll bring that up again um, at a later date, okay? And full prescribing information used in specific populations, how to treat an overdose. Sometimes patients, um, not on purpose, may take more than they should have of the medication that's been prescribed to them. And there may be something in that information, in that package insert, that will tell you how to treat an overdose. All right. So uh, very, very important to have that information available or type of medication to give as um what, 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 what we would call an antidote, all right? Um, full prescribing, uh, oh, I just went over that. Um, 
And again, as I said before, use in patients with kidney or liver problems. So always know the, the most you can um, tell about your patients, which keeps your patients safe, especially when it comes to administering medications. I know you were given information in Nursing 123 about what a big responsibility this is in um, administering medications, and we should never, ever take it lightly. Um, but when we know the necessary information about the drug as well as about our patient, then we're doing all we can to keep the patient safe and provide the best effects from these medications. I'm not going to go over any of the oral medications with this particular chapter. Um, I'm more focused on the um, injectable medications, so I'm going to go through that a little bit quickly. All right, uh, this is definitely what I wanted to talk about with you, okay? Medications that are given by injection into veins or into tissues are said to be given by the parenteral route. And drugs can be injected into the skin, which is intradermal or ID, subcutaneous tissues, or muscles, intramuscular or IM. We're not going to do any intravenous or IV. We're more concerned with the first three because that will be um, what you will do with your first skills checkoff. Nurses typically only perform ID, sub-Q, uh, taneous, IM, and IV injections. Become familiar with the different types of syringes used by your facility and the markings on those syringes to reduce the risk of making an error. All right, very important to know. And that's why we're going to go over the parts of a uh, hypodermic syringe, which I have here up on the screen, okay? As you can see on the right, this is a typical uh, syringe with a needle and the safety cap in place. So first of all, let's talk about the needle. That can range in length from anywhere from a quarter to four inches. And think about intradermal and subcutaneous injections. We don't have to go as deep um, into the skin. So those will require shorter needles such as a quarter or five-eighths inch. Now your intramuscular injections, we use longer needles, really depending on the patient's size, and that can be anywhere from one inch to three inches depending on the size of the patient, okay? And now we have to look at the needle itself. When we talk about gauges, that refers to the diameter of the needle, all right? how big that opening is in the needle. And it can be from a very fine or a very small gauge, which would be a 31 gauge, to a large gauge, which would be a 14 gauge. And it seems kind of um, controversial. When you look at those numbers, you would think that the higher number would be a larger gauge, but it's just quite the opposite. Uh, the larger the number, the smaller the gauge. Um, and 14 gauge needles um, may be used um, for a patient that has a fistula and maybe um, they're connecting them to the hemodialysis machine, okay? And as you can see um, from this picture, um, the needle is surrounded by what we call a safety cap. And once the injection has been given, then we flip that cap over and that kind of protects the needle from causing any type of a needle stick or injury to the patient again or even to the nurse, okay? So um, a very, very um, nice way of how these syringes have been developed over the years, okay? And, um, you know, it's very important that that um, safety cap is put into place immediately after the injection is given to protect you as the nurse in case your patient has some kind of transmittable uh, organism that could be um, passed on to you if you were accidentally stuck with that particular needle. So a very good thing to have on hand is those um, safety caps. So now let's look at the barrel. We've talked about this, the needle, so please remember about the needle. Um, we're concerned about the length and the diameter, but now we're looking at the barrel, and that contains a uh, calibrated dosing scale and has a hub at one end and a phalange at the other end. And the hub of the syringe is either a slip tip or a lure lock. In just a few minutes, the next slide will show you that picture. So needles attached to a slip tip hub can be easily removed or slipped from the syringe by pulling the two pieces apart. And your new 
lure lock hubs are threaded to allow needles and other devices to be connected securely to the syringe. And let me just um, scroll this up a little bit for you. Sorry. And then the phalange at the phalange at the um, end of the plunger allows the nurse to manipulate the plunger without touching the sterile portion. So let me show you this um, in in a picture. Okay. Oh, here, let's go. All right. This is what we were talking about when we were referring to the the barrel. Okay. All right. So hopefully this is on your screen and you see this. This is an example of a three milliliter syringe. And as you can see, um, we can interchange that word milliliters with cc's. People may say cc's. We're talking about the same um, type of unit. <coughs> Excuse me. So right here we have the barrel. And at the end, this is what we mean by the phalange, okay? And then you can see the calibrated markings. Um, and then, of course, right here at the tip is what we call that hub. And as you can see, it's marked off with 0 0.5. And you can see now they have that 0 in front of the decimal point, which is what you do uh, when you're um, calculating your dosage um, calculations, your DA problems, always put that zero in front of the decimal point to denote that there is a decimal point. And this would be one milliliter, this would be one and a half milliliters, two, two and a half, and three. And it's important to think about when a particular medication is ordered, we would always use the smallest syringe to accommodate that amount of fluid or medication that the patient has been ordered. And as you can see, uh, these calibrations would be um, 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.5. And you can see we can get as small as 0.4 as well. And then say, for instance, um, when you calculate that particular medication, it comes out to be uh, 0.8. Well, right here is 0.8. This would be 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and this would be 0 0.8. So we could get it to that precise um, measurement um, by using this 3 milliliter syringe. So remember, the phalange, the calibrated markings, and the hub. Now these calibrations and these denominations of what that calibration represents changes when we use different sizes of syringes. Okay, so that's important to know. Um, so very important to know. And then right here is an example of those two types of um, um, hubs. We have the lure lock hub and then we have the slip tip hub. So these are what those look like. All right. And this kind of locks into the syringe and kind of turn it and then you can remove the syringe as well. All right. And then we have the plunger, and the plunger slides within the interior of the syringe. The tip of the plunger is usually made of a black rubber-like material and has two rings that make contact with the interior walls of the barrel. And the ring closest to the medication is where the dosage is read. All right. And then the phalange at the end of the plunger allows the nurse to manipulate the plunger without touching the sterile portion. So let me show you uh, this plunger. There you go. This is the uh, plunger right here, and this is uh, the phalange. This is the, the plunger phalange right here, which pushes that medication. And then this is what we talk about, the top ring and the bottom ring. And right here is where we read the dosage at this particular line right here. Okay, does everybody see that, where that arrow is at? This is where we read the medication. Okay, to make sure we're giving the correct amount. So this is what we call the plunger, which you can see fits nicely into the barrel. And this right here is an example of a five milliliter syringe. So let's talk about the sizes and the types of syringes. Sorry, I want to bring this up a little bit. Okay, there we go. 
All right. Uh, your hypodermic syringes come in varying sizes, 1 milliliter, 3 milliliters, 5 or 6, 10 or 12, 20 or 30, or 60 milliliters. Um, a 1 milliliter syringe is very small. Um, think about it. It only has 1 milliliter in it. So those calibrations are going to be very, very small. You are going to have increments of a, a, a 0 0.1 milliliter between the short lines and 0.1 milliliter between the dark long lines. Um, probably your 1 milliliter, your 3 milliliters, your 5 milliliters, your 10 milliliters, your 20 milliliters are probably your most common syringes, okay? Uh, another name for that 1 milliliter syringe is what we call a TB, uh, a tuberculin syringe. Uh, the median size lines in between the longer marker indicate 0 0.5. Point zero zero point zero five, and besides being used for the TB skin test, the one milliliter syringe is used for administering very small, precise amounts of medication. All right, so um, and I'll show you that syringe in just a minute. Okay, and here it is right here. This is the one milliliter, and as you can see, this whole thing is only one milliliters. But you can see how skinny this syringe is. So you have zero point one, and then obviously that comes to zero point five but then these increments are point zero five which makes sense because that's how precise you can get of a medication using a tuberculin syringe and then you can even get smaller that it can go down to 0 0.01. These tiny little lines right here. These are the bigger lines between these numbers and then the smaller ones are 0 0.01. So that's what we call a tuberculin syringe or a one milliliter syringe. And then, of course, we talked about the 3 milliliter already, and that's calibrating increments of 0 0.1 milliliters between the short lines right here, which I talked about before. Okay? And then your 5 milliliter will be 0 0.2, and that makes sense because it's 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and then 1 milliliter. So that makes sense. And that's kind of how you have to uh, think about it. But see how that changes depending on the size of your syringe. And then your 10 milliliters, you also calibrate in increments of 0 0.2 milliliters. 0 0.2, 0 0.4. So if the medication was right here, it would be 1.6 milliliters. Does everybody understand that? Because those are the exercises that I want you to do uh, from your DA book, which helps you to understand what each of those increments represent, depending on the size of the syringe. And then we have a 20 milliliter syringe, which now is 1 milliliter. So that would be 1 milliliter, 2 milliliters, 3 milliliters, 4 milliliters, 5 milliliters. Um, up to 20 milliliters it holds. All right. We're going to talk more about insulin and insulin syringes in week four when we talk about insulin, but because insulin syringes are given the sub-Q route, I'm just going to mention it because this may be one of the um, skills that you may have to perform is giving a sub-Q with an insulin syringe. Okay, that's why we have Glargen as um, one of our medications for week one. So insulin syringes are calibrated in units instead of milliliters. That's very important. And it may be a U100 or U500 syringe, which should be compatible with the type of insulin that you use. So that's why it's important that when you find the syringe that you have, that you look at the bottle of insulin to make sure that it correlates with the type of syringe. So if you're using a U100 syringe, you should use U100 um, insulin. Designed to be used with insulin only. We only use insulin syringes 
calibrated in units with insulin only. They can come in varying sizes from 30 mill units to 100 units and typically um, come with the needle permanently attached to the syringe. And as you can see, this one um, holds up to 50 units of insulin. And you can see it's in 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, and so on increments of insulin. Okay, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this um, if you've already given um, insulin injections. Maybe you haven't because you haven't been checked off yet. That's right. Okay. Measuring medications in a syringe requires familiarity with the calibration markings on the selected syringe and take the opportunity to study available syringes to become familiar with those calibrated uh, markings. Absolutely. So these are some practice questions that we can kind of do together. So what is the maximum volume that we can be drawn up in this syringe? And what volume is indicated by the blue line? And what volume is indicated by the yellow line? So obviously this is a one milliliter syringe. So that's the maximum amount of volume that can be drawn up. And then the blue line indicates 0 0.5, which would be a half of a milliliter. And the yellow line indicates 0 0.8. Do you see that? So hopefully you understand those answers. Okay. So here's some um, questions, but it pertains to a bigger syringe. What is the maximum volume that we can draw up in this syringe? And that would be a 3 a milliliter. And what volume is indicated by the blue? It would be 0 0.4. And then volume indicated by the yellow would be 2.5. So that would be from a 3 milliliter syringe. And calculating dosage for medication given parenterally follows the same process as calculating doses for an oral medication. Medications injected intradermally, subcutaneously, or intramuscular are given in small quantities due to the limit capacity of these tissues to accept fluid. Now this information is very, very important, okay, and I want you to initially memorize these amounts, but then think about why is it that amount, just what this um, note says, because depending on what, where you're going and what route you're, you're giving, you're, you're using, will depend on what's the maximum amount of fluid you can give in that particular tissue. So think about intradermal. Those are only limited to 0 0.1 milliliters, okay? And subcutaneous injections are limited to 1 milliliter. Now I think your Callahan book, your uh, clinical nursing skills book states that subcutaneous can um, are limited to 1.5 so there is a little discrepancy between your DA book and your um, Callahan book so I would accept either answer and then your intramuscular injections are limited to either 4 to 5 milliliters and if you calculate an answer for a particular injection site is greater than the guidelines then recheck your math Okay, and that's a great important. Does that answer make sense? All right, so very important to know. All right, so you need to understand these maximum amounts of fluid that are injected into that particular um, area, um, you know, in the skin. These are just practice problems um, that you may want to do on your own um, to kind of help refresh um, doing DA problems. And a provider provides for osamide uh, 20 milligrams intravenously every 12 hours. The pharmacy provides uh, for osamide uh, in the vial shown. And again, this shows your skill at reading uh, this particular label. We have 40 milligrams equals four milliliters 
which comes out to be 10 milligrams per ml. So if 20 milligrams is ordered for the patient uh, IV, then uh, the answer would be um, two milliliters. Okay, makes sense? And it just shows you that this vial only has a maximum of four milliliters. So the most you could give from this particular vial would be 40 milligrams because it only holds four milliliters. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? All right, these are the things that you kind of have to think about and look at these labels and process them. All right, I just want, and probably if you turn that vial around, you'd be able to see an expiration date that as well, okay? And then you want to think about um, if you're giving this medication, um, depending on this order, which was 20 milligrams, um, which would amount to uh, two milliliters, we could put that in what size syringe would you use? A three milliliter syringe. Okay. All right. So this just shows the steps of how you would um, calculate this, setting it up um, in uh, an equation according to dimensional analysis. And I was right. So it does come out to two milliliters, okay? And I know you guys are, are, are very good at dimensional analysis, but I will um, provide um, worksheets for you in regards to DA because I think this is a skill that we just have to keep doing and doing and doing because it's not only about setting up the equation correctly. That's obviously the most important aspect because we want to get the right uh, dosage by the time we finish the, the calculation, but we need to set them up quickly because there could be a time when your patient is not doing well, he's crashing, we've got to give meds um, immediately, and we got to set these problems up very, very quickly. So that's also my goal is to make sure that you're doing that very quickly, all right? And this indicate the amount of medication to draw up on the syringe below. Okay, so we would put it at two milliliters exactly right here, okay? Because this is a three milliliter syringe and that would be the correct choice of what size syringe to use for this particular problem. So here's another example uh, of a problem. A provider uh, orders methylprednisone prednisolone, 125 milligrams intravenously every 20, every 12 hours. The pharmacy provides methyl prednisolone uh, or salumedrol in vials containing 80 milligrams per uh, milliliters. What volume medication should be drawn up in the, in the syringe? So again, so the answer comes out to 1.56 and remember with our rounding we want to um, round it to the nearest tenth so uh, because it is over halfway uh, to 100 0.56 is over halfway we round it up to 1.6 okay so so indicate the amount of medication to drop on this syringe we've got 1.5 right here so 1.6 would be at this first line below that. So hopefully that makes sense to you, okay? And again, uh, here's another practice problem. Uh, methyl dopal uh, aldamat, 50 milligrams intravenously every six hours. And so you can practice doing these problems as well. All right. So these are, again, um, in the last two slides of um, Chapter 9, which, um, as I said before, is uploaded in your Canvas course. All right. So the main take of Chapter 9 is about injectable uh, medications, uh, looking at the syringe, the parts of the syringe, the syringe types and sizes. Understanding about those needle gauges, 
that the higher the number, the smaller the gauge, and the gauge refers to the diameter of that needle, okay, how big that lumen is for uh, medication to pass through. Uh, looking at the insulin syringe, that we only use those syringes for the administr administration of insulin, and that we measure that in units and not mLs. So those are my take um, home points from um, this particular chapter, okay? So let me know if you have any questions on that. As you can see here on the screen, I also um, advised you to review Chapter 7, which has to do with safety considerations in medication administration. And I know um, in your Nursing 123 class, um, your instructors definitely went over um, about medication errors, which I feel is, is something that really needs to be addressed again when we talk about medication errors, um, that it is any preventable preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare provider. Healthcare professional, patient, or consumer. Such events may be related to professional practice, healthcare products, procedures, and systems, including prescribing, order communication, product labeling, packaging, and non enclature compounding, dispensing, distribution, administration, education, monitoring, and use. So I want you to definitely go over this again uh, because I don't think we could ever, ever stress the importance of um, continuing to uh, provide safety for our patients when we administer medication. Medication errors in the hospital setting cause hundreds of thousands of patients to suffer illness or injury and cost patients, hospitals, health care providers, and insurance companies billions of dollars. So I just think it's something we need to hear again, and this makes us even more um, vigilant on being sure that we are doing everything possible to give our patients their medications in the best and safest way, all right? Um, Again, more information and um, statistics um, coming from 2013, which is very old information because it's now 2020, but I'm sure this number is much higher than it was, um, is today than it was back in 2013, all right? Um, a lot of um, important information in this PowerPoint. Um, again, we talked about uh, the Nurse Practice Act and nursing one. 121. And again, each state has a Nurse Practice Act, laws that define a nurse's scope of practice and responsibilities. Again, these are here to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And each state has a Board of Nursing that defines nursing education requirements, scope of practice, and establishes disciplinary procedures for nurses who break the law. Okay? So I just want to remind you on the importance of this because you're really giving medications that really can um, affect your patients in a very negative way and that's why it's important that we understand uh, the responsibility that goes with passing medications to our patients. And then of course all healthcare facilities have written policies and procedures that outline a nurse's scope of practice and responsibilities for medication administration and documentation. It is the nurse's responsibility to become familiar with the policies and procedures of the facility in which he or she practices. So that's again very important, especially now. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about it now because you don't have any clinical um, responsibilities, but you will hopefully in the summer that we'll be able to get back to our, norm, our normal routine and you'll be back in the acute care setting to be able to um, uh, administer medications in a hospital type of facility. All right. Talking about unit dose medications are packaged individually in sterile, clearly marked packages. Um, and what are the advantages of these unit um, dose systems. Um, they do help increase safety for the patient and unit dose medications should be transported to the bedside in their original packaging to reduce the chance of errors. Okay, 
So. And then just to talk about how caution should be uh, taken with multiple dose, dose containers. Um, again, looking at that expiration date and also to handle all containers that contain medication uh, very carefully to reduce the chance of contamination. Okay. And knowing that um, if a label states single use only, so if you only pull out um, one dose, um, even if there is uh, medication left, it should be discarded. And many of our hospitals have the automatic medication dispensing uh, systems that are computer operated storage and dispensing devices for medication and healthcare related supplies. So, um, and it will depend on what facility that you're in to be able to um, use these um, Pixis or whatever um, medication dispensing system that you're uh, going to be uh, pulling your meds from as well. All right. May look like something like this. Um, where, you know, you have to, um, I know as an instructor, um, when I did clinicals at some of the hospitals, um, I had to use my fingerprint as well and to be um, kind of put into the system so I was able to uh, pull medications with the students as well. And there are some advantages um, to these types of systems. Um, they improve inventory management. Which helps reduce loss to the co uh, which helps to reduce cost and improves uh, efficiency, um, better security, and you're able to track all the transactions for every patient and every user are recorded, so that if there are discrepancies, we can go back and see who was the last one to pull medications from that particular device. Uh, faster access for nurses to patient medications, and some of these cabinets are mobile mobile and maybe move from room to room. So there are some good advantages to doing it this way. And again, it, the bottom line is to improve patient safety by reducing the risk of errors. Okay, and this might be um, another type of system, especially when we're pulling medications that have barcodes and things like that. And that's another a way in which we uh, ensure safety for our patients. Okay. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, reinforcing the importance of the six rights and the three checks. Keep medication errors from reaching patients requires careful attention. At minimum, the nurse should use the six rights of medication administration when preparing and administering medications. And additionally, the nurse should check the medication label against the medication administration record at least three times before administering the drug. And I know you're all doing this, okay? So following the six rights and the three checks does not guarantee that the drugs are given without error. Human factors and weaknesses in medication administration systems also contribute to adverse outcomes for patients, even if the six rights and three checks have been followed. Okay, so it doesn't mean that it can't happen, but it really can cut down in errors. And these again are the six, the six rights of medication. So uh, I'll conclude um, this particular uh, PowerPoint slide with three checks. Uh, the first one is check the time of administration, the name of the medication, and the dose against the MARS as medications are pulled from the medication card or the AMD cabinet. Check two is check the medications with the MARS after all the medications have been attained, but prior to entering the patient's room. And check three is check the medications with the MARS a third time at the patient's bedside after ensuring the right patient is about to receive the medication. So again, I wanted to review the six rights of medication and then the three checks. Okay, so make sure you go over those and you understand those and you know those, all right? And then the rest of these slides uh, 
just talk about uh, the barcode medication uh, administration. So um, please review those. Those are just the last few slides on this PowerPoint. All right, that concludes um, the PowerPoints uh, with chapters nine and chapter seven. Um, I also would advise you, according to the lesson plan, that you review chapter 16 uh, in your DA book regarding heparin administration. Uh, I'm going to talk about the medications in just a few minutes. And then um, you may also want to review chapters 5 and 6 on measurements and conversions. There may be um, some more common types of conversions on your um, test 1. All right. So... I think that pretty much covers uh, the important information uh, from um, your DA, uh, your Horn Vet uh, book on um, parental uh, administration or those types of uh, injections and routes. Please, please uh, be sure that you're doing the practice problems and even some of the chapter post test. Um, I may get a few of the questions that are at, in those particular review exercises um, from the book. Um, but I guess it, it, it's important to do those because it does evaluate your learning to see if you understand the information that I presented you uh, with these PowerPoints and from the reading. All right, um, uh, we'll move on and um, I'll discuss in part two uh, the medications that you were assigned to uh, review and look up. Thank you for your attention.